Okay, so to start the rest of our, the second half of our study for the test, let's take a look at some vocabulary type things. Um, let's say that we are given that um, property taxes are normally distributed with a mean of 66 and standard deviation of 19. That's on dollars per acre there. And let's say we take a sample of 48 properties and the sample it results in a sample mean of 60 9 with standard deviation of 6. So what I want to do is based on what I just wrote here, I want to identify what would be the sample size. Well, first of all, the symbol for sample size is N. And that would equal, there's 48 properties sample, 48. Sample mean, well, the symbol for the sample mean is X bar, that was 69. The sample standard deviation, symbol for that is just S, that was 6. Population mean. Symbol for that is mu, and in this situation that was 66. Population standard deviation. That is sigma, and that was listed as 19. Make things a little more difficult here. Let's look at values that have to be calculated. Um, let's say that we were going to do all the possible size, take all samples of size n equals 48 from this population. What would we expect, or what would be the mean of the sample means? Well, the correct symbol for this is mu of x bar, and that would be equal to the population mean, 66. The mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean, always. The mean of the, uh, the standard deviation of the sample mean, I should say, that would be sigma of x bar. That is going to be the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So 19 divided by 48, or 19 divided by the square root of 48, I should say, which gives us 2.742, 2.74 we'll draw it to. <coughs> Another situation we want to look at, we want to review our normal probabilities. 
So let's say that <coughs> we are looking at hourly wages. for UAS, University of Amer American Statisticians, students. Yeah, I know, I sometimes think I'm funny. So anyway, hourly wages for UAS students are normally distributed mean $10.50 and standard deviation of the 75 cents. <coughs> so let's find the probability that a randomly selected student one earns more than twelve dollars per hour. So this is going to be normal CDF, more than $12. We can start at $12 and we go to positive infinity. I'm going to just use the, the six nines for my positive infinity. You could also use the one E99. The six nines is just easier for me to enter and write out. With a standard deviation, of course, we're going to put in the mean of 1050 and standard deviation of 0.75. So the second distributions, normal CDF, 12 comma 9999999 comma 10.5 comma 0.75. That spits out 0 0.02275. That's the probability. Two earns less than ten dollars per hour. So this is going to be normal CDF less than would be a negative infinity. So we're going from a negative. I'm going to use the, the six nines again. Again, I could use a negative one e ninety nine to ten with a mean of 10.50, standard deviation of 0.75. Make sure you use that key for the negative, by the way, not just minus. Otherwise, it will cause problems. We get 0.2525. Now, what if we ask, what is the probability that a sample of 42 students gives A mean less than 10. So now it's still going to be normal CDF. And it's still going to be less than, so it's negative infinity to 10. And the mean is still 1050. But what's changed now 
is we're not going to use the standard deviation. We have to use that standard error, which is going to be our 75 cents divided by the square root of 42, adjusted for that square root of the sample size. And I can actually just enter that all into the calculator just like that. So normal CDF, negative infinity. Again, I use the six nines instead of the negative one E99, just because it's simpler to enter for me. 10 comma, 1050 comma, and now I can just put in 0.75 divided by the square root of 42. I error a lot of it to close my parentheses. And there it is. Now see how small that is. That's scientific notation. That's E negative 6. That's times 10 to the negative 6. What that is saying is 0 0.00000779. That's a pretty small probability. So 0.25, that's not, not that big of a stretch to have an individual under 10 bucks. But to have a sample of 42 under 10 bucks an hour, to have a mean under 10 bucks an hour is quite a stretch. <coughs> that is our sampling distribution. So you've got you to be very careful when we're dealing with normal probabilities. Is it an individual value like we had up here? So you can just use the standard deviation. Or are we talking about the mean of a group, the mean of a sample? In which case, you've got to take that standard deviation divided by the square root of that sample size. Okay, let's talk about some hypothesis testing. Just like with our confidence intervals, there are going to be three types of hypothesis tests. Two of those types are for, the first two types are for means. And just like with confidence intervals, there's a Z and a T. And of course, the Z is where we know the population standard deviation. In other words, we know sigma. And of course, the other, the T is when we don't know the population standard deviation. And then, of course, we have our test for proportions. Now, for the means, we do still have, you know, the stat option or the data option on the calculator. So we can either be given the summary statistics for our sample, or we can be given the list of all of the results for our sample and have to plug them in and... and Put them into our and enter them into our list. So let's take a look. <coughs> now the, the biggest thing with our any type of hypothesis testing is setting up the hypothesis. We have the null hypothesis, which is the most important part of all of it. The null hypothesis labeled H0 is the status quo or the accepted value or you put it as the opposing the other person's claim put it as the other side if we're trying to show something the alternative, H1, sometimes listed as HA, that is what we want to show. That's our side. I shouldn't say what we want to show. It's what we're trying to test, to see. Um, I don't want to say what we, it's what we want to show because that would show a bias. And in statistics, you're very careful not to have a bias. <coughs> also, within each, each test, then, the null hypothesis, the, sorry, the, Null hypothesis is always equal to, it's mu is equal to, or p is equal to, some value. The alternative hypothesis then is, could be less than, greater than, or not equal to. And we mentioned that earlier, that you know, the, the null is always equal to. And it's always mu, not x bar, or p for proportion. Depending on what the alternative hypothesis is, it determines what type of test we are. If the alternative hypothesis is less than, then it is what we call a left tail test. 
which means we're going to reject if our value from our sample, our test statistic, is too far out to the left. <coughs> so if it's small enough, we can reject the null hypothesis and side with the alternative. If it's greater than, it's what is called a right tail test, which means we're going to re reject the null hypothesis only if our sample gives a value that's way out on that right tail. So if our test statistic is on the right tail. If it's not equal to, it's what we call a two tail test. Not equal to means if the, the, the sample gives something really small or something really large, then we can reject that null hypothesis. So let's take a peek. <coughs> so let's say that a resort owner claims the average family spends less than $600 for a weekend. The standard deviation of the weekend cost is $250. A sample of 45 stays gives a mean cost of $612 for the weekend. Conduct a, let's do a 90% hypothesis test for the mean, for the population mean. <coughs> First, our hypotheses have to be set up. So the owner's claim is going to be the null. He claims that it is less than $600. So the mean is equal to 600. Remember that null hypothesis is always equal to. H1, the alternative, is going to be the mean is greater than 600. So that's how we indicate, even though his claim was less than, we put in equal to. The way we indicate that it really means less than or equal to is by making the null greater than. So now we're looking at this and saying, well, geez, the sample gave us a mean of 612. That's greater than 600. Shouldn't that reject it right there? And Well, common sense says so, but in reality, not necessarily. There's a chance that we just took a sample of 45 stays that happened to be more expensive than normal. So we're looking at, when we have, do hypothesis tests, it's just like a confidence interval. We assume this bell curve and that the mean, the center of that bell curve is our hypothesized value. A 90% test means that 90% of the area is acceptable and the other 10 is not acceptable. This might also be, be written as a, a test with significance level of 0 0.10 or of an alpha of 0.10. Both of those correspond to a 90% test. 90% or 0.9 of the area is in the acceptable region. 10% or 0.10 is in the rejection region, we would call it. So now it's the alternative hypothesis that tells us where the rejection region is on this curve. It's greater than, so we're looking at the upper tail. So what we're saying is we're going to take the top 10% of this and we're going to reject on it. So if any part, if our 
sample gives us a value that falls in this top 10%, we will reject that hypothesis. So let's take a look and see where our sample falls for us. Yeah, make it. <coughs> so to see where this ends up now, first of all, is this a z-test or a t-test? says the standard deviation of a weekend stay is $250. That is the population standard deviation. So since we have that, that makes this a z-test. Now, how do we know for sure? Well, because it wasn't until after they gave the standard deviation that they started talking about the sample. So we know that standard deviation had to come from the population. So then we'll go ahead and do a z-test. This is a one sample or one population z-test, which is just a standard z-test. Our rejection rule is we will reject HO if the p-value is less than alpha. So if the p-value is less than 0.10. So if we look in the calculator, we clear this out. We're going to go to stat, test. We're going to do a z-test. Um, we got to enter in, we're going to use stats, we're using summary statistics. Mu naught there, mu zero, that is what is in our null hypothesis. So we'll put in 600. Sigma, that is our population standard deviation that was given above at 250. X bar, that's our sample mean, 612. And our sample size is 45, so that's right. Then it wants us to put in the null, the alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis here is greater than. So we've got over and select greater than. Then we'll hit calculate. So we get, there's our test. Again, it's showing the alternative is mu is greater than 600. Z is 0 0.32. 322, I guess is what I'll write that as. That is our test statistic. Z is equal to 0.322. So that's saying it's 3.22 standard deviations, a Z score of 3.22 basically for that sample mean compared to the other sample means within the distribution of sample means. Also gives a p value of 0.3737. So what that is saying is, is when we put this on our curve here, somewhere in here, is a z-score of 0.322. The probability of being greater than that is 0.3737. So it's nowhere near far enough out on the tail to reject. So since the p-value is not less than alpha of 0.10, we fail to reject h0. So the statement is because the p-value is not less than alpha. We fail to reject HO. Or we could say there is not sufficient evidence to reject the resort's claim. Notice we did not say we accept HO because we didn't. We didn't prove that HO is correct. We just showed that in this sample there is not enough evidence to say that it is incorrect. So that same type of test then would fall in if we, did, if we didn't know the population standard deviation. It would fall into a t-test with the same type of considerations. And for population proportion, it's going to fall in the same way, just like we did with our confidence intervals. So... We're going to leave it at that for now. If you guys have any other questions, please let me know. I'll try to help you out. Otherwise, good luck on the test.